Hi there, welcome back to my channel. My name is Jessica Isla, or Jess. Thank you so much for joining me today. As you can see, we're gonna be doing another true crime get ready with me. And today we are gonna be diving into a case that's state-based for me, or state-based, but um, I guess like in my state. Um, and we're gonna be discussing the 1991 yogurt shop murders that took place in Austin, Texas. So. Before we jump into it, I did want to say I my sources are in the description box below. Um, there was a amazing YouTube video that gave so much detailed information, um, and that's called Night Shift Nightmare, The Unsolved Austin Yogurt Shop Murders by Cold Case Detective here on YouTube, and that came out in 2021. So that was my probably main resource, but I did look at a couple news articles and then of course the Wikipedia page, so those are all listed down below as well. So I guess... Let's go ahead and jump into it. Okay, let's start with our poor four victims. So we have 17-year-old Jennifer Harbison, 17-year-old Eliza Thomas, 15-year-old Sarah Harbison, the younger sister of Jennifer, and then 13-year-old Amy Ayers. And they all seem like loving and so sweet and so caring and they all loved animals, that's something they all had in common, and they were all involved in the, uh, is it the Future Farmers of America? Yeah, Future Farmers of America program. Um, and they just seemed like such sweet people. I mean, you know, in, in this um, video documentary I was watching, like it showed photos and like their family members talked about them and they all just seemed like so sweet and bright and, and wonderful, um, which of course, because people are terrible and just I feel like some people just can't stand to see other people shine you know anyway that's not the point of this but um so those are our our poor victims and um so let's jump to December 6 1991 the night of the murders so Jennifer and Eliza knew uh or not knew they had they worked at the I can't believe it's yogurt shop in um kind of north central Austin and they um, had a night shift that night. It was a Friday night. That December 6th was a Friday. So when um, Sarah Harbison, Jennifer's younger sister, got home, she told her mom that her and her friend Amy Ayers wanted to go to the mall that night. And then they wanted Amy to spend the night at their house. Their mom, uh, Sarah's mom, agreed. And she said, ask your big sister, Jennifer, if she'll drop you guys off at the mall on her way into her shift at the I Can't Believe It's yogurt shop. And then she can't, you guys can go back to the shop when you're finished and then you can, she can drive everybody home. And they all agree. They all decided it was a great idea. And so they moved forward with the plan. Um, Jennifer dropped the two girls off at the mall. And then... Um, she went to I can't the I can't believe it's yogurt shop um, to start her shift with the our other one of our other victims, 17 year old Eliza Thomas. And so everything everything that night proceeds normally. The girl's shift at the yogurt shop is like uneventful, normal, you know, Friday night. And uh, the girls at the mall have a good time. And then they walk back to the presumably walk back to, i couldn't actually find out how they got back to the yogurt shop but i don't think it was very far from there so walk back to the yogurt shop and a customer sees all four girls in the yogurt shop around 10 p.m and this will be the last time that anyone actually sees um, all four girls alive so Next thing we hear from the yogurt shop is at 11.47 p.m. that night. Hang on, I need to put on a lip mask. I totally forgot. Um, at 11.47 p.m. that night, and remember, like, so far in our timeline, uh, all four girls are back at the yogurt shop and are seen by lost customers at, like, 10. And so, 11.47, a patrolman is, you know patrolling his area um, where the near where the yogurt shop is and he sees a fire coming from the yogurt shop so he immediately calls it in um you know backup comes over and they put out the fire at the shop and that's when they discover the bodies 
of Jennifer, Sarah, Eliza, and Amy. And they are all, oh, it's just so freaking sad. Um, they are all in this like back storage room and they're all bound and naked. And um, Eliza, Jennifer, and uh, Sarah are all kind of grouped together. Um, Amy is found about like 10 feet away from the rest of the girls, also naked on her stomach with her like arm kind of stretched out like she was reaching. So they believe she might have like been alive when she was with the other girls and then like crawled away before she passed away. And so um, they've determined that um, two of them have been sexually assaulted. I couldn't find if, if more because it said they'd been sexually assaulted but I know for sure it was at least two of them. And then they had, like I said, they'd been bound, um, stripped, sexually assaulted, and then they were all shot in the head. And then the storage room was set on fire. So their bodies were, from what I understand, very um, charred and destroyed. So it's just ultra sad and depressing for those poor, poor parents. But people who do this, I don't think are thinking about parents in this moment, so. Sorry, I've had a cat join me now, so. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. So due to the fire, there's very little forensic evidence, um, but they do determine that all the all four girls were shot with a 22 caliber, and like I said, they were shot in the head. Um, but that's really all like the forensics that they find at the time. So um, a couple days pass, there's a funeral held for all four girls, a public funeral and over 1500 people attend. Um, so these girls were absolutely like adored, um, which isn't surprising from the way um, they were described and like shown in this documentary. So that's pretty much it for like what, what is found out the night of the murder, these poor girls and their families God, they're just grieving this whole the whole city's grieving at this point um for these young girls who were just taken way way too soon so of course please start investigating and let's move on to suspects because there's going to be a few in this tale so on a couple like a week or so later on the 14th of december of the same year a young man is arrested at the mall and this would be the same mall where amy and uh, Sarah went before they went back to the yogurt shop. So interesting. And they um, and they arrest a young man named Maurice Pierce for possession of a handgun, and it would be a 22 caliber. And if we if we think back to just a second ago, that is the same weapon that was used in the murders of these four girls so of course he's brought in for questioning and under interrogation he admits that um his friend uh forrest wellborn used the gun to commit the murders so he tells police this and for some reason like nothing's really done with it because in later that month um at the end of december police announced to the media that they really um have few leads in this case and it, it really hasn't gone anywhere so it's kind of like okay but you've um come to find out that basically there was um the tip by uh this kid maurice got buried in paperwork after one of the lead detectives that was on the case was taken off of it because of um accusations of um coercing false confessions in prior cases not in this one necessarily but in like prior ones so he's taken off this case and the confession of maurice basically just kind of gets put in into a file and and nothing's done with it so um little happens in the next year this again this is december 1991 when this took place and so throughout 1992 not much really happens um until october of 1992 when mexican authorities say that they have arrested a gentleman named i'm gonna have to look at my notes for this because i'm not gonna i'm probably gonna butcher this so i apologize um porfirio villa uh saavedra known as the terminator who is in a motorcycle gang and he confessed to mexican authorities that he committed these murders 
Um, and he was questioned for this because there was, I guess, um, a witness said that there was a gentleman like kind of lingering around the outside of the yogurt shop and he matched the description of this gentleman. So this comes out and everyone's like, oh my gosh, do we finally have the person? But it is ultimately determined um, that Mexican authorities tortured him um, and he made a false confession because he immediately recanted um, once he had the chance. Ultimately determined that he uh, did not commit the murders. So once again, kind of just like another lead that went nowhere. And so we're back to square one, basically. So that was um, October of 1992, and the case basically goes cold for a few years. And then in 1996, at the end of 1996, a new detective is assigned to the case to review the, the cold case file. Coffee break. So the detective that comes on, he pulls all the old files and he, of course, pulls the Maurice Pierce interview for further review because I'm sure he was like, what is this? So even though he finds this, you know, confession, nothing ends up happening until um, 1999. And this was at, 19, at the end of 1996 or early 1997 when he was reopening this. So I don't know what, um, you know, was the holdup or whatever, but some reason 1999 is when um forensic investigators decide that they're going to test maurice pierce's gun against the gun used in the crime scene which um again i'm sure because of that detective um that got kicked off the case because of like you know coercing false confessions i'm sure because he whatever happened with him at the time this is why they didn't test it but all my in my mind i'm like why would they not do that like first thing you know, like if they like that was the whole reason he was arrested at the mall to begin with, like in December of 1991. And now we're in 1999, which is insane. But they finally test the gun and it does not match the gun used at the crime scene. So you think at this like they would kind of be like, OK, well, so if it doesn't match, why would he say his friend used the gun in this? Like you think that like logical thinking, but I don't know. I mean, like either the pressure or if they just decided that they wanted to kind of go through with this still is ultimately what they decided to do because police still decide to bring in uh one of maurice's friends named michael scott at multiple times over 1999 to question him and so of course he's questioned and then under um multiple hours of questioning he confesses to being a part of the murders and so, of course, police arrest him. And so then they travel to North Carolina to um, to talk with or interrogate another one of uh, their friends. And this would be Robert Springsteen. Springsteen is interrogated for hours until he confesses to sexually assaulting um, Amy and taking part in the murders. So of course he's arrested as well. Um, at this point, arrest warrants are issued for all four gentlemen. I shouldn't say that because two of them are boys. They are 15 and 16. And then two of them I believe are adults. Robert and Michael, I believe are adults and Maurice and Forrest are both in their teens. So, um, so they're all arrested, and at this point, their uh, DNA and blood is collected for analysis, um, as you do. So when they arrest them, they decide that um, they're going to try Pierce and Walborn as adults, even though, like I said, they're 15 and 16, um, and that they want to seek the death penalty for Robert Springsteen and Michael Scott. So they're all brought in, and again, like at this point, like the gun's been determined to not have been the murder weapon. Like um, they didn't have any like DNA or blood collected at the scene, so I don't think like getting their DNA at this point has really done anything because there's nothing to compare it to. So, um, and then in kind of a twist, another judge dismisses the capital murder charge against Wellborn, and he's let go, and he's never charged with anything again. So it's kind of, I don't know, it was kind of one of those like 180 situations where it just seemed like everything was kind of progressing and moving forward with these uh, four men being charged and arrested, and then he's just kind of let go. So I think, I'm sure that left a lot of people confused at the time. I didn't, couldn't really read much about it. So then we're gonna jump ahead a little bit 
because in 2001, Robert Springsteen is found guilty of his crimes and the murders, um, and he is sentenced to death. And then the next year, in 2002, Michael Scott is also found guilty, but he's sentenced to life in prison. A few months after Scott is sentenced... Sorry, I have to look at notes down here because this like there's so much back and forth on this story because of all the random suspects and anyway. Um, so then a few months after uh, Scott is sentenced in 2002, um, they dismiss all charges against Maurice Pierce, citing not enough evidence at this time. And then he would be released from jail after three years because, again, he was arrested three years prior and he's just been like sitting in jail while they were you know making a case and whatever so like i can't imagine how yeah that would just be interesting okay and then let's jump ahead again because in 2006 um sorry i can't do two things at once apparently in 2006 the texas criminal court of appeals overturns uh, Springsteed's conviction saying, quote, written confession by Scott was improperly used against Springsteen in his own testimony. And then in 2007, Scott's convictions also overturned, citing the same reason. And so when I was reading that, um, I am not a lawyer. So I was like, what exactly does that mean? So I looked it up. So the Sixth Amendment gives defendants the right to confront accusers, and in Scott and Springsteen's trials, their confessions were used against one another, but they were not allowed to question each other in court, and that's ultimately why their convictions were overturned. Um, I had to look that up, and I also got that, like, that's a direct quote from one of the articles, I believe, that'll be down um, in the description box below. So if you want to read about it yourself, because, yeah, I was just, like, I don't really understand, but then again, like I said, I'm not a lawyer, so... So... We move forward, and in the spring of, nine, of 2008, 1998, no, uh, we're way past that, um, of 2008, it's announced that unknown male DNA has been found on Amy Ayer's body. And so, of course, everyone, like, this is finally, like, some kind of an advancement because, sorry, I'm trying to decide what to do because I really did not have a plan of what I was going to do with my makeup today. Um, and of course everyone like with advancements in technology, like I think people were maybe hoping that this is what would happen, but you never really know. So it was finally kind of a breakthrough because there was really nothing else that had been found um, at the time in the shop. And so they really didn't have anything to go on. So of course um, this is really good news, but again, it's, unknown so they tested against the four suspects none of them match they tested against like uh police personnel and uh, first responders to make sure none of them are a match and they're not either so even though they have this male dna unfortunately it doesn't do too much and then the next year in 2009 it's also found on um jennifer harbison's body as well so earlier when i referenced that for sure at least two of the girls were sexually assaulted um that's why i say that because um it's never actually referenced no one actually officially says like all all four of them but just based on the dna it can be at least determined that it was two of them so um ultra ultra depressing and sad but here we are the story is just going to be sad as we all kind of knew i'm sure you were assuming going into this so um because people are terrible as i've said many times so um moving on again so um yeah so at this point there's male dna connected but that is kind of it there's really unfortunately not a lot else to go on they, um, they have this DNA, but because of the fire, like I said earlier as well, they're kind of, that's, that's really, that's really all so, they got. So. In 2000, in late 2009, all charges are officially dropped against Springsteen and Scott. They're officially no more sus sus suspects to go, to, you know, to go off of. They have this DNA, but... No one to compare it to, unfortunately. 
And since then, there have been no active leads in the investigation, which is just, like, super depressing. Um, but there are a couple updates I can share. Before I share those updates, I did want to um, say kind of a random fact, I guess I found out, or like a random thing, but um, I couldn't really find what happened to the four suspects once, you know, like they were left in charge. I mean, I'm sure they're like trying to stay out of the spotlight because, you know, um, they were wrongfully convicted for a like brutal, brutal murder that of course, like everyone wanted justice seen. So I'm sure like there's plenty of people who still don't, you know, aren't fans. But the only thing I could find was that Maurice Pierce in 2010 um, was uh, pulled over by Austin Police Department. And I guess he like ran on foot and so they chased after him. And then when they caught up with him, he stabbed the officer that had caught up to him in the neck. And so um, the police officer shot and killed him. So he passed away in 2010. So even, I just thought that was kind of an interesting fact. I don't know. I mean, obviously it's sad because again, like when all this happened, he was the 15 year old kid and I'm sure he, I don't know. I, I, I can't even begin to like imagine what he was going through. So I'm not even going to try. <laughs> so <clears throat> let's get, there's not much, but I did want to bring up a couple updates. So in interviews and um, old reports, you know, from when the case first happened, um, it was noted that witnesses um, in the yogurt shop saw two men behaving suspiciously. Um, and this was noted by several customers. Um, one of them was even a, he actually talks in this like documentary that I watched on YouTube. Again, it'll be below if you want to check it out. It was really good. Um, but he even talks and says that like, you know, he was a former cop. He was very weary of them. Like one of the guys, um, they were standing in line and, you know, to get yogurt, obviously. And this guy kept like letting people uh, go ahead of him, kind of like he was just waiting and like scoping things out. And the cop guy was getting weirded out. So when he had finally got to him and said like, go, go ahead, go ahead of me, he said, no, I don't want to. And so he like kind of made him go up and he ordered like a soda. And then he just went and sat back, back down with his friend. So it was all kind of weird. Like they were just acting very strange. Um, they were sitting in a, in a lone booth together and I don't know, I guess they just weren't weren't giving off good vibes to anybody because multiple people commented that they were acting strangely and that they, you know, didn't, I don't know, like love them being there because the last couple customers in the shop re remember them staying once everyone started leaving when the girls were closing up. So they are either the very, very last people to see these girls alive or given the tight time frame, a lot of people believe that they actually had something to do with the, the murders. So, um, unfortunately they've never been identified. Um, so hopefully, I don't know, someone steps forward. You think that, that if they were there and they didn't do anything that they might want to come forward and at least like cl one clear their names. Cause a lot of, again, a lot of people assume that they're responsible for this or, um, at least help out, you know, like give them in, like maybe provide some information that they, you know, don't have. But again, like given the tight time frame, I feel like it's more likely that, um, they might've had something to do with the the murders and that would make sense of why they're not coming forward so um not many murderers want to like turn themselves in and you know it just doesn't really make sense unfortunately until someone comes forward or you know like again no one you know we're not going to know who those two men are they do have a good description of them um, which is good, but unfortunately that hasn't gone anywhere yet. So, but you never know, maybe it will, um, who knows? Um, the only other updates, unfortunately that I have, because like I said, this is still an unsolved case, um, is that in 
2022, it was announced that due to advancements in DNA, once again, that um, they're getting closer than ever to solving the case. I know that's really vague, but that's kind of like all I could find out. So let's hope that, I don't know, that DNA advancements, I mean, nowadays with like, look at the Golden State Killer case, like, I mean, familial DNA being used. Although I was in that documentary and in some of the articles I was reading, it looks like that can't be done with the type of DNA that was found at this crime scene. Um, that that can only be done with like a specific type of DNA, and unfortunately this one doesn't. But just the fact that they have DNA, I think, is hopeful. Because before they had nothing. You know, that was only found in 2008. And this crime took place in 1991. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll find something, or like this will lead to something. But the moment it hasn't. Um, but there was one last piece of good news that will hopefully again help this case like get solved. But in um, August of 2022, President Biden signed, I'm going to read this verbatim so that I can tell you exactly what it is. The Homicide Victims Families Right Act into law. And this law was motivated by the yogurt shop murders. And essentially... It is intended to help ensure that federal law enforcement reviews cold, co cold case files and applies the latest technologies and investigated standards to them. So it basically means that like if a family member or someone reaches out and they say like, I want you to look like re review this case that's been cold or whatnot, like they legally have to do it. Now, I don't know. I don't know any of like the requirements. It might be one of those things where like if someone puts in a request, like it will take another couple years. I mean, I hope that's not the case and it doesn't kind of sound like it, but I don't know. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this will get solved. I mean, I couldn't tell you when obviously, but, um, I really hope it does just because those, those poor families, you know, like they're just left with so many questions. I can't imagine. So like I said, my sources will be cited down below, so if you want to read any of the articles that um, I did or watch the documentary, it was very informative, really like well done and concise. Um, and you do, and you get to see like like a little like a little insight into their these poor girls' lives. But it was it was a really well done piece, and and I, I highly recommend it. But um, so yeah, so that is the 1991 yogurt shop murders just again like no words you know like who who is doing this stuff i guess the only thing i have left is my lips so i'm going to i'm going to do that real quick well i hope you guys have a great day or night wherever you are um and again i apologize if these are like still a little choppy um i'm still getting used to like doing makeup on camera and uh also just trying to like talk through these stories and um put as much deal detail in there as possible, but also like kind of get the timing correct. So bear with me. It might take me uh, like a few tries to, to be better at this, I guess. But um, again, I hope you enjoyed and I will see you next time. Bye.